Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the flash presentation session of this year's International Conference on Food Digestion. I hope you have enjoyed the conference so far. There were some very interesting talks today. And let's now proceed with the flash presentation, which we hope you will enjoy equally, if not even more. Uh, to start with, let me first introduce ourselves. We are a team of postdoctoral researchers here in Chagask Moor Park. And today with you are Talita, Alice, Daniela, Gitan, Gulden, and myself, Kata. Also with us is Maureen Egan. She's our communication manager and tech wizard. So if there is no Maureen today, there will be no poster session. So thank you, Maureen, for all of your help in organizing this session. To facilitate the program, Alice will now tell us more on how we'll, we will proceed. So, Alice, please. Good evening and a very warm welcome to this special session of Flash Presentations. 24 researchers have accepted the challenge to present the work in just three minutes. They will be introduced in groups of five and following each group, we will have a short Q&A with them. We are very excited to announce that the best flash presentation will be awarded and the winner will be announced tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. On this occasion, we would like to thank Infogest for sponsoring the award. Now it is quite a competition as you will soon see. So we would love it if you can help us decide. In addition to other criteria, we would take into account your vote. At the end of the session, you will be asked to vote for your favorite flash presentation. So without further ado, let's start with the first group. Thanks, Alice, for this. As you have heard, there will be a prize for our best presentation. So please take a note on presentation number of up to two of your favorite presentations. Uh, during the broadcasting of pre-recorded videos, you will be able to use the Q&A uh, question box in the lower part of your Zoom uh, screen to ask any particular question you might have. We ask you here to address the question to the speaker, so we can then proceed during the Q&A session after each group of five presentations. And as I already mentioned, without further ado, let's proceed to the group one. In the group one, we will have the pleasure of hearing the presentations from Kai Wang from University of Manchester, Ricardo de Asunção from University of Aveiro, Andrea del Rio from Wageningen University, Aisha Garrido from University of Granada, and Karina dos Santos, who is presenting from Brazilian Agriculture Research Corporation. I will ask you all to please mute yourself and turn off your cameras while videos are played. Thank you and enjoy. Hello, today I'm going to talk about modified in vitro digestion models for evaluating the allergenic potential of novel foods including GMOs. Nowadays, the allergenicity concern over the novel food has been put forward. One of the tools used in the risk assessment of GMOs is the pepsin resistant test, but it uses unphysiological conditions regarding enzyme levels and a fixed pH, while the pH and the levels of enzymes change depending on the meal consumed, age, and the use of antacids. This study adapted the model into a 96 wealth plate format to investigate how protein structure may affect the susceptibility to digestion. A set of proteins was selected and the explicit peptide cutter was used to predict cleavage sites. Two pepsin to substrate ratio and four pH conditions were utilized and digestion were monitored by SDS page. As we can see, ovalbumin and RH1 were predicted to be the most digestible protein due to the highest number of predicted sites. 
and PUF3 and cytochrome C are the most resistant to pepsin lysis with the smallest number of predicted cleavage sites. And lysis on an RH alpha lactobumin should have similar digestion pattern due to the similar number of pepsin cleavage sites. And here we have the SDS page example for beta casein. At pH 5.5, beta casein was immediately digested in 0.3 minutes with its large proteolysis products till the end of digestion. And at pH 6.5, beta casein was almost completely resistant to digestion with three relatively large low abundance digestion products. Here we've got a summary of patterns of protein using the low pepsin under different pH conditions. Generally, the digestion was more extensive at pH 1.2 and 2.5 than the higher pH. As predicted, RH1 was highly digestible, but overbooming was more resistant. Similarly, the PROOF3 was highly resistant, but the cytochrome C proved to be very sensitive at low pH. And the protein from the same superfamily, like lysozyme and alpha-lactobumin, has significantly different digestibility. So, in conclusion, the in silico prediction were not confirmed experimentally, suggesting the algorithm are too simplistic and not reliable. And the data from this study indicates that the protein digestibility is affected by the stability to low pH denaturation, and the effectiveness of in silico model can be improved if they take protein folding into account. Here are also some take home messages. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ricardo Sonson, and I'm a researcher at the Food and Nutrition Department of the National Institute of Health, Dr. Ricardo Jorge, in Lisbon, Portugal. The title of my presentation is One Method, Multiple Applications, the Use of the InfoGest 2.0 Static In Vitro Digestion Method Under Different Contexts. And this presentation aims to provide an overview of the multiple applications of the InfoGest 2.0 method, providing some examples of studies already performed in our department applying this method. Foods could simultaneously present components that could exert beneficial and adverse health effects. Under this context, the impact of the digestive processes constitutes an important facet requesting appropriate methodologies that simulate the physiological conditions. The InfoGest 2.0 method has received increasing attention, mainly due to its wide applicability and comprehensive harmonization. At our institute, this method has been applied in several domains, in nutritional studies, addressing cooking and processing methods to characterize nutrients by accessibility, regarding functional foods that are being developed, contributing to ensure that the nutrients of interest will be effectively digested and made available to the human body the study of the survival capacity of lactic acid bacteria present in yogurts and other fermented foods in order to quantify bacteria reaching the intestine that could exert their probiotic functions, and determination of mycotoxins and other chemical contaminants, as well as nanomaterials bioaccessibility to anticipate the amounts that could reach the intestine and contribute to assessing the associated risk-benefit equilibrium. Here on the left, we could see the impact of culinary processing on the minerals bioaccessibility in quinoa. Results showed that boiled quinoa presented the highest bioaccessibility for calcium, copper, and iron. On the right, the amounts of two mycotoxins that could reach the intestine after digestion as are summarized, reflecting differences according to the toxin studied. These examples demonstrate that InfoGest 2.0 method could be applied in different contexts, contributing to overcome important and pertinent research questions. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, let me know, and I will be glad to answer them. Thank you so much. I'm Andrea Rivera del Rio, and I want to tell you that in protein digestion, the gastric phase matters a lot. When food enters a fasted stomach, it encounters a small amount of gastric fluid, 
So in gastric emptying starts, the chyme entering the duodenum has a relatively high pH. Towards the end of the gastric phase, due to gastric secretions, chyme has a lower pH and protein has been hydrolyzed by pepsin. We wanted to study the impact of the gastric phase on the extent and efficiency of protein hydrolysis taking place in the duodenum. We used isothermal titration calorimetry to estimate enzyme kinetics from the heat generated by catalysis. This is a convenient method that allows to directly estimate the rate of catalysis at different substrate concentrations within one assay without the need to label or modify the substrate. Bovine serum albumin was used as a model protein. To simulate the different extents of exposure to the gastric environment, the assay was directly hydrolyzed by trypsin or acidified and hydrolyzed by pepsin before being hydrolyzed by trypsin. Likewise, we used the recently proposed semi-dynamic in vitro digestion method on pea protein fraction, which allows us to simulate the dynamic nature of the gastric secretions and emptying. We determined the hydrolysis ratio after trypsin of intact neutral and acidified protein and the pepsin hydrolysis. This measure considers only the free amino group from trypsin catalyzed hydrolysis. We see that the pepsin hydrolysate is more extensively hydrolyzed than the intact proteins, and that this is related mainly to the prior hydrolysis rather than mere acidification. In terms of the hydrolytic efficiency, which tells us how often a productive enzyme substrate complex is formed, the best substrate is also the pepsin hydrolysate. Using the new semi-dynamic in vitro digestion method, we simulated five gastric emptying steps from high to low pH and from low to high pepsin concentration of a pea protein rich fraction. Each gastric emptying step was followed by 120 minutes in a duodenal phase with pancreas. As expected, the degree of hydrolysis in the gastric phase increased as did the residence time in the stomach. Nevertheless, if we look only at the hydrolysis taking place in the duodenal phase, we see that towards the last gastric emptying steps, protein has been better prepared to be more extensively hydrolyzed by pancreatic enzymes. We have seen that pepsin-catalyzed hydrolysis and acidification of protein ensure a more efficient and extensive hydrolysis in the small intestine. We did this with the help of isothermal titration calorimetry, which is a powerful tool rarely used to study food digestion. Thank you so much for your attention, and remember that in protein digestion, the gastric phase matters a lot. Hello, I'm Aisha Aguilera Garrido from the University of Granada, and I would like to talk to you about how hyaluronic acid can modify the digestibility of albumin nanoemulsions and improve the intestinal bioaccessibility of curcumin. The aura bioaccessibility of curcumin is limited by its low water solubility and the low stability of this compound in biological fluids. Here we have included curcumin into the daily core of olive oil nanoemulsion stabilized with bovine serum albumin or bovine serum albumin and hyaluronic acid to improve the oral bioaccessibility of this compound. We have a study or nanocapsule under in vitro digestion condition by measuring the surface charge and size of the nanoparticle, the curcumin release pattern and the protein degradation pattern. Uh, a deeper analysis of the interfacial microstructure has been carried out on the octopus. This device allows us to recreate the shell of the nanoparticles thanks to the formation of an interfacial layer in a droplet of water, which is immersed in olive oil. Moreover, this device allows us to exchange the inner content of the droplet so we can recreate the digestive process and analyze the changes that the interface undergoes. Curcumin quantification reveals that nanocapsule stabilizes with hyaluronic acid and serum albumin retain better curcumin under gastric condition and that they allow the release of curcumin at intestinal level. On the other hand, the colloidal characterization shows that none of the system is stable after the whole digestive process. SDS electrophoresis gels reveal that hyaluronic acid slows down the degradation of the albumin at gastric level. However, after the intestinal step, the protein shell has been completely degraded in both cases. The interfacial tension results also reveal some differences at, at gastric level, and the higher interfacial tension of albumin 
uh, layers indicate a higher susceptibility to proteolysis, which means that the aluronic acid confers some protection to the albumin layer in this case. Once again, after the intestinal step, none of the layer resists the action of the bile salt as the reduction of the interfacial tension revealed here. We can conclude that we have two different systems which improve curcumin solubility, but it's the one stabilizes with albumin and hyaluronic acid, the system which retain better curcumin at gastric levels. Therefore, is this system the one which will improve curcumin accessibility at intestinal level? If you want to know more about this work, you can access the presentation with QR code. And thank you so much for your attention. My name is Karina dos Santos, and I will present the study effects of Shabuticaba fuel on the composition and activity of the gut microbiota in a multi-stage simulator of intestinal digestion. Shabuticaba is a small Brazilian fruit. Its black peel is rich in dietary fiber and polyphenols, mainly anthocyanins and elagitanins and has been shown to exert beneficial health effects in animal and human study. We hypothesize that the observed health effect could be mediated by changes in the gut microbiota. So the aim of this study was to investigate the effect of the fuel powder, JPP, on the population and metabolic activity of select intestinal microbial groups based on the digestion trial in the BFBL gut model. The three colonic reactors were inoculated with a pooled fecal sample. And after stabilization, the nutrient medium was supplemented with two gram, grams per liter of JPP during seven days collected from the colonic reactors were analyzed by key PCR for Fecalibacterium, Rosebudia, and Ruminococcus cluster 4. Short-chain fatty acids were determined by HPLC. Relevant increases in the target micro microbial population were detected by key PCR after the two the seven days treatment with JPP. In the three coronic reactors for Zebudi, in transversal and descendant colon reactors for Fecalibacterium, and in descendant colon reactor for Pneumococcus. Metabolic changes were also detected mainly increases in acetate and butyrate content of reactors two and three, which may be related to the observed increase in butyrate producing microbial groups. In conclusion, the experimental results indicate that the JPP is able to modulate the composition and functionality of the unit gut microbiota, being promising as a potential prebiotic. Further studies are necessary to confirm this. Okay, thank you all uh, presenters from the group one. I will ask you now all uh, to turn on your camera and your mics, please. So if we can all um, answer the questions uh, that are coming from the audience. Thank you. So we have the first question, it's addressed to Kai, and it is, what difference would you expect in the pepsin cleavage sites that are used at pH 1.4 and 2? So actually the pH, uh, the pepsin has higher specificity when the, in the extremely low pH, like 1.3. So as we know, the pepsin prefer to cleave the uh, phenomenalamine, tyrosine, and tryptophan 
and leucine. But when the pH lower to 1.3, then it will more specific to uh, phenylalanine and leucine. And when pH increase to higher than two, then the specificity will be lost. So that's why I used two different algorithms to predict the pepsin cleavage sites. Yeah. Okay, thanks Kai. And I hope, I guess this is uh, the answer for, for your question. Uh, second question we have here is for Ricardo. And it is, which is the survival rate of probiotics submitted to the InfoGest digestion? The survival, could, could it be dependent on the food used as delivery vehicle? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, in fact, the, the survival rate was quite de de dependent uh, on the, um, the type of food that we analyzed. So in fact, we analyzed the yogurts and also soya fermented uh, foods. And um, yeah, and as the question referred, in fact, it was dependent on the type of food and in the nature of the food, if the liquid or solid, the yogurts, for instance, it's quite dependent. Okay, okay, thank you for that, Ricardo. Thank you. Uh, another question here we have for Aisha. Uh, and it is, have you done any work on interactions formed between hyaluronic acid and albumin? And how are those interactions, uh, how, how are they contributing to the stabilization of particles? Okay, the interaction between the the albumin and the hyaluronic acid have been mm, uh, seen on the droplets. The, the experiment that we have done with the droplet, with the, which allows us to perform an interfacial layer of albumin or albumin and hyaluronic acid. So there we have studied the, the rheology of the interface and the interfacial tension. So we have seen the, the changes on the interface that the hyaluronic acid promotes. I don't know if this answers okay. the question. Okay, I, I hope that answers the question. Yes. And I would say the final one, well, I just have to know that uh, we have many questions incoming, but unfortunately we are limited with time and we won't be able to answer all of them. However, we will ask per, uh, presenters to answer any questions uh, uh, that are uh, related to their presentations. And those questions will be sent via email to, every, uh, to, to the person who were asking the questions. So very quickly, the last question for Andrea uh, is, what do you consider optimal intestinal protein hydrolysis in your, in your presentation? Yeah, thank you for that question. Well, I guess it's relative uh, to the others. So if we look at the hydrolysis taking place by pepsin for just acidified, excuse me, for trypsin for just acidified protein, and if we compare it to the one that was hydrolyzed by pepsin beforehand, then we see that, yes, in fact, it's better. So compared to the other substrates, this is the most optimal. Okay. Thank you for that, Andrea, and all of, the, all of the participants. Great work in presenting your work in under three minutes. And I'm afraid, Daniela, we don't have any more time for, for, for more questions. So can you please introduce the next session of speakers? Thank you. Thank you, Kata. So now we will have a formal presentation. So let us welcome the speakers. Um, we will uh, be joined by Gabriel Lopez from the University of Valencia, Sofia Melchior from the University of Udine, uh, also Rais Vreck, who is a PhD student at Wageningen University. Then we will also have one presentation from Valeria Josafato from the University of Naples, Federico II. And finally, Flavia Casciano, who present results of her PhD at the University of Bologna. Again, uh, as for the previous presentation, if you have questions for any of the speakers, please don't hesitate to write your question um, in the Q&A section. Please include also the name of the speaker or the code of the presentation when you, when you type in your, your question. And I will also 
so ask the speakers to keep their microphones on mute while the videos are playing. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentations. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gabriel Lopez, and I am a postdoctoral researcher in the Bionutes Researcher Group of the University of Valencia. Today, I will describe the effect of gastric lipase and cholesterol esterase on sterol bioaccessibility. In a previous study of our research group, the InfoHash method has been adapted for studying the sterol bioaccessibility in plant sterol enriched beverages, showing that only bovine origin at 10 millimolar allows to quantify all sterile study. The effect of the addition of the gastric lipase proposed by InfoHES 2.0 or other enzymes as cholesterol esterase has not been studied yet. The aim of this study is to evaluate their effect on sterile by accessibility in a plant sterile enriched milk based fruit beverage. For this purpose, the studied beverage or a deionized water are subjected to the infoges uh, digestion uh, without and with gastric lipase and cholesterol esterase addition. By accessible fraction are obtained by centrifugation and sterol are quantified by gas chromatography. Both enzymes reduce the bioaccessibility of all plant sterols evaluated, which could be due to the high cholesterol content observed in the blank of digestion, perhaps leading to an saturation issue. This in turn causes the stigma sterol to be under the limit of quantification after gastric lipase and cholesterol esterase addition. In case of cholesterol, only the addition of cholesterol esterase prevents quantification. This observed difference could be due to the production of monodiacylglycerides by gastric lipases, which could be compensating the reduction of bioaccessibility. We hypothesize that gastric lipase and cholesterol esterase could favor esterified cholesterol hydrolysis from bovine bile salts, improving its incorporation into the measles. The increase of free cholesterol could compete with plant sterol for the incorporation into the measles, which lead to a general reduction of plant sterol by accessibility. As a conclusion, I would like to point out that the addition of gastric lipase or cholesterol esterase reduces plant sterol by accessibility and does not allow stigma sterol and or cholesterol quantification in the plant sterol enriched beverage. Further adaptation of the method in terms of enzymes used would be necessary. As a take-home message, note that for a sterile termination in plant sterile and rich beverages, it is necessary to evaluate the sterile contribution of the blanco digestion, as well as optimizing the concentration of the enzyme used. Thank you so much. Good evening, it's a pleasure for me to share at this conference our results regarding protein digestibility in adult and elderly conditions. Elderly are the faster growing segment of the world population and more than ever, it is essential to find out strategies to reduce their protein deficiency. The latter is due to both the physiological digestibility reduction and dietary habits. However, up to now, the information about the elderly digestion behavior is scarce. Thus, the aim of this study was to compare in vitro digestion fate of proteins in adult and elderly conditions. To this propose, pea, rice, and gluten were selected as plant proteins, while milk whey proteins were the animal reference sample. Samples were then submitted to adult and elderly in vitro digestion, and the elderly conditions were reproduced by modifying adult protocols in terms of enzyme concentration, pH, and phase duration. Finally, protein digestibility was assessed and the digester was characterized by confocal microscopy and particle size distribution. At the end of the gastric phase in adult conditions, pea and rice were less digestible than whey proteins and gluten. The latter are probably easily accessible to enzymes as shown by confocal micrographs of the digested clots, which are smaller and less compact than pea and rice one. By contrast, in elderly, all proteins, with the exception of gluten, were less digestible. 
Compared with adult gastric behavior, in this case, the aggregates were smaller and fewer peptides were detected, as can be observed in the case of P. This behavior could be attributed to the molecular structure of proteins and in particular to the presence of sulfidryl groups, more abundant in gluten and whey proteins, as well as to the physiological condition applied and in particular to the pH. Also at the end of the intestinal phase, a significant reduction in protein digestibility was observed in elderly, with the only exception of gluten. This was confirmed by particle size distribution. Taking P. digesta as an example, smaller particles were detected in adult condition than in elderly ones, while in gluten the differences were observed. To conclude, almost all the considered proteins were less digestible in elderly, indicating that the method is able to discriminate adult and elderly behavior. Overall, proteolysis is strongly dependent on protein molecular structure and digestion conditions. Thus, it's not possible to infer the digestion fate of protein and predict the general trend. Moreover, it is essential to study the elderly gastrointestinal fate in order to design age-tailored foods. Thank you for your attention and many thanks to the Food Technology Research Group of the University of Udine, to which I belong to. Hello everyone, I'm Gijs Freke and I'm working together with Peter Wieringa in the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. So, I think many of us are interested in uh, understanding protein digestion. And I typically study uh, peptide release kinetics. And there I have some questions. One thing is whether are all the peptides that are present also identified? Because the numbers of peptides that are reported for, different for the same experiment by different persons uh, is variable. Uh, also, these values do not match the theoretical maximum number uh, of peptides that could be expected. Uh, then I'm wondering about the concentration of the peptides and how much of the composition can be explained by the peptides that are analyzed. So therefore the aim is to develop the UPLC MSUV method for automated peptide identification and label-free quantification of protein hydrolysates while maintaining the quality of analysis. Uh, therefore we hydrolyzed uh, proteins with uh, bovine trypsin and then we analyzed these hydrolysates manually and automated and afterwards we made mixtures to implement complexity. So we developed this method uh, based on the following steps. First we determined the mass accuracy, then we separated the signals from the noise, then we identified the MSMS fragments and we removed insert fragments and then in the end we calculated the amino acid sequence coverage and peptide sequence coverage to uh, analyze the completeness. Now, as you can see, the number of peptides that are initially annotated is reduced to 38 uh, peptides in this case. Um, then we plotted all the identified peptides against the sequence of the initial protein. And uh, as you can see, also in the mixed hydrolysates, we identify almost 100% of each protein uh, back in the peptides. Then we quantify the peptides based on their uh, molar extinction coefficient and their UV absorbance at 240 nanometer. And then uh, we plotted the sum over the peptides in terms of amino acid concentration against the sequence of the protein. And we can visualize the completeness of quantification. And here we see that also in the mixture, we almost recover every amino acid quantitatively. So to conclude, an approach was proposed for the development of UPLC MSUV data processing. And as a take home message, please also evaluate the completeness of your own analysis by calculating the various sequence coverages. Good afternoon to everyone. 
I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the possibility to have these flash presentations that it focuses on the use of milk whey proteins to prepare edible films that were further fractionalized by means of polyphenols extract from pecan nut shell. Milk whey is responsible for relevant environmental problems due to its both large volume and high organic content. However, it contains functional proteins endowed with valuable features, making them of interest of different biotechnological applications. Thus, the present work involves a possible uh, result of whey proteins for preparing biodegradable packaging materials. In particular, bioactive films containing pecan nut shell extract condensed uh, with the condensed tannin as the main phenolic components were prepared and characterized. Pecan nut shell is produced mainly in the United States and Mexico and they represent a valuable source of antioxidant phenolic compounds. The films that were uh, produced by the solvent casting technique by means of a method set up in our lab were very manipulable and with a very nice color when they were prepared in the presence of the pecan extract. Besides, they were characterized by means of antimicrobial and antioxidant uh, properties and they were demonstrated to possess antimicrobial properties against enterococcus fecalin and salmonella tifimunum and to act as antioxidant molecules. The films were characterized according to their mechanical features and the gas barrier properties. We demonstrated that the films prepared in the presence of extract were stiffer, um, less flexible and also more mechanical resistance. In addition, the film gas barrier properties characterization demonstrated that our films prepared in the presence of extract acted as a good barrier against carbon dioxide, oxygen, oxygen and water vapor. In addition, in order for an application of such films in the field of food packaging, we have performed a gastric digestion experiment where we demonstrated that the films prepared in the presence of the extract were digested faster than the films prepared in the presence of the extract. All these observations confirm the possibility to use the films functionalized with the pecan extract for food preservation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Good afternoon, my name is Laia Casciano and I'm from the University of Bologna. The title of the study I'm going to show is in vitro intestinal model to study the prebiotic potential of novel food supplements. A prebiotic is a substrate that can be utilized by us microbiota conferring health benefit. Its definition has recently been revised by including, in addition to the already known fibers, output oligosaccharides and inulin, also molecules, for example, short-chain fatty acids, medium-chain fatty acids, polyphenols and terpenes. Many health benefits deriving from prebiotics are driven by the gut microbiota. The activity of the gut microbiota can be explored thanks to in vitro models. The aim of this study was to evaluate the prebiotic potential of two new food supplements. One was a fiber supplement enriched in D-limon in FLS and the other was a liquid-based ingredient, the DBI. These two supplements were fermented with our single-stage intestinal model, MICOD, simulating the condition of human distal colon, and microbial metabolites and microbial shift were analyzed. For the results of the FLS among the volatile trackable, we focused on those that are related to prebiotic activity. Healthy compounds, how short-chain fatty acids and medium-chain fatty acids increased at the end point, while unfound ones, how branched chain fatty acids and scatol decreased. We observed an increase of beneficial microorganisms, in particular bifidobacteriaceae, and a decrease of harmful ones, such as enterobacteriaceae. The prebiotic potential of this supplement is expressed with the prebiotic index proposed by us with some modification. FLS in particular showed best prebiotic activity after 24 hours of fermentation. 
For that concern, results of the Aquin, we observed a clear distinction based on aldehydes for the volatilum. In particular, the Aquin did not produce SCFA, but neither did the harmful BCFA, resulting from the fermentation of proteins. The Aquin supported the growth of harmful microorganisms as the proteolytic clostridiales group first, but this was balanced by lipidogenic activity recorded. Lastly, the Aquid did not show relevant PI value after 24 hours of fermentation. In conclusion, on the basis of results carried out with our model, FLS obtained best results at the end point, so a prolonged fermentation could increase its prebiotic activity. In the other end, the Aquid showed interesting results, our lack of BCFA production and the bifidogenic activity, which deserve further study. Okay, thank you everyone. You can now turn on your cameras. We have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, so let's start with the first presentation from Gabrielle. You, you have one question and one invitation. So it's really good to see that even in the virtual format, we can, we can see this kind of uh, interaction. Um, uh, uh, Gabriel, the question is, how did you decide the concentration of two units per milliliter of cholesterol esterase for your experiments? Well, we choose uh, this concentration based on a previous study performed in carotenoids. The author observed or obtained the highest bioaccessibility of carotenoids at this specific concentration. So we thought that uh, this concentration would be a good starting point to evaluate the sterile by accessibility in our case. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we will send you, so uh, we, there is another um, uh, invi uh, the invitation for you for uh, joining a ring trial for InfoGest uh, work group four. We will send you this by email so you have all the details. Um, and uh, we also have a question here for uh, Sophia uh, about your uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, we have the, a question from Patricia. She's asking if you know uh, whether intestinal absorption is also modified in the elderly population. Well, uh, it's a very nice question. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this is uh, the first step of our work and uh, we're trying to, to reproduce elderly conditions. Uh, right now, we are working on uh, um, the um, study uh, of uh, um, the absorption of proteins and uh, also bioactive compounds through uh, um, analysis on caco cells and uh, organoids. Mm -hmm. So it's a work in progress. Okay, good. So soon you will have more answers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, now we also have one question for uh, Rice, Rice um, from Andre Broadcorp. His, his question is: How do you take into a, how do you take account of mis cleavages? Uh, for example, cleavage one or two amino acids away from the predicted cleavage site. Uh, this would dramatically increase the number of peptides possible. Yeah, thank you for the question. So we uh, analyze peptides from, from dipeptides to maybe seven kilodalton. So, and we don't necessarily have restrictions to the, the specificity of the enzyme. So we also did some tests in which we I uh, used pepsin hydrolysates, and that was also, uh, yeah, then we can also identify the peptides that are, are present. So it does not limit our work. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if we still have time um, for any. We have a minute left for minute. this session, so if someone okay, can answer we have fast. One short question yes. here for Flavia, maybe. Can you tell us um, how you prepare your uh, liquid material? Yes, um, the aim of uh, our study was to evaluate the prebiotic potential of the liquid. 
So for definition, a prebiotic arrive undigested in the colon. So we um, directly inoculated 1% of the aquid in our mitro gut model. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have more questions, but we cannot answer all of them uh, now, so we can move uh, to the next presentation. We will email the questions to the speakers at the end. So now I'm going to hand over to Talita and Gaetan, who are going to present the next sessions. Thank you very much for, to the speakers for being here with us. Thank you, Daniela. Um, our next speakers are Katarina Pe Pauschen from Cat Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, Catal Dode from Chagas in Ireland, Simona Vita from University of Bologna in Italy, Marta Herrera from Instituto de la Graça in Spain, and Cristina Hesche from University of the Balearic Islands, Spain. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Katarina, and I'm going to talk to you about the factors that influence large digestion pulses and how we can use this knowledge to move towards more complex digestion conditions. In pulses, cell digestion is influenced by the bioencapsulation inside of the cotyledon cells and the co-ingestion of protein. Yet, most studies focus on the evaluation of only starch digestion and pulses using static in vitro digestion models. Mimicking the in vivo reality in terms of salivary alpha amylase com combined with a gastric pH acidification might affect the oral gastric enzymatic activity. Unfortunately, the introduction of such dynamic parameters automatically results in increased complexity of the setup. Therefore, our question was, how can we use our current simple digestion setup using a kinetic single reactor approach while increasing the complexity and thus the relevancy. Therefore, we designed a set of distinct trials testing on the one hand side static pH levels and on the other hand side reproducing gastric acidification condition. What we observed was that after orogastric digestion with salivary alpha amylase and the gastric pH, more than 23% of the total starch had been released within the first 60 minutes. When we repeated these experiments with the gastric pH tree, and only the gradual gastric pH, we observed the absence of amylolysis. More strikingly, the overall starch digestion increased by approximately 25% after orogastric predigestion. Interestingly, that effect was also visible when solely a gradual gastric pH was applied. We hypothesized that this increase might be caused by the differences in protein digestion. When we evaluated protein di digestion, we measured the proportion of proteins which had been solubilized during digestion, hydrolyzing the digestive supernatant into its monomeric fraction using acid hydrolysis. We now look at the influence of the different parameters of protein digestion. We observe that despite inducing differences in gastric proteolysis kinetics, we can see little changes in the overall protein digestion. Nonetheless, we hypothesized that the relatively small increase of protein digestion resulted into a significant increase in starch digestion. So now I have shown you that both gastric pH combined with and without salivary alpha amylase influence starch and protein digestion kinetics and pulses. By this, we highlight the possibility of using a hypothesis-based approach, introducing dynamic factors in in vitro models while sticking to simple and cost-efficient settings. So now I would like to thank you, the organizers, and all people who have contributed to my work. Hi, everyone. My name is Cahal Dold, and I am a PhD student based in the Chagas Food Research Center in Moor Park for my county, Cork, Ireland. Today, the title of my presentation is Processing Influences Protein Digestibility of Infant Milk Formula, a Pig Study. The aims of our project were to produce IMF with a reduced thermal load. Furthermore, we wanted to understand if processing affects digestibility 
of IMF. In our trial, we produced IMF using the standard heat treatment method, seen here in red on the left. This process involves preheating the milk at 80 degrees for 30 seconds, followed by a final heat treatment of 125 degrees for a further five seconds. In contrast, we also produced IMF using an alternative processing method known as cascade membrane filtration. CMF utilizes various filtration membranes of 1.4 and 0.2 micrometers to produce IMF with a reduced thermal load. Following on from our IMF production trial, we conducted a pig study. Pigs were aged 28 days at weaning and were divided by treatment. Pigs were fed twice daily for 28 days, with IMF accounting for 35% of their total diet. At age 56 days, 180 minutes after their final feeding, the pigs were slaughtered, with digestive samples collected immediately from the stomach and small intestine. So, what do our results indicate? Our results suggest that the degree of hydrolysis in the stomachs of the pigs fed CMF IMF was significantly higher than the degree of hydrolysis in the stomach of the pigs fed high temperature IMF. Seen here in blue, 357 micromoles of amino groups per gram of protein were released from the stomach of the pigs fed CMF IMF in contrast with only 286 micromoles of amino groups per gram of protein released from the stomach of the pigs fed to high temperature IMF. Furthermore, the average daily feed intake of the pigs on day seven fed CMF IMF was significantly higher than the average daily feed intake of the pigs fed to high temperature IMF. To conclude, does processing affect the digestibility of infant milk formula? Cascade membrane filtration, as seen in our results, significantly increases the degree of hydrolysis in the stomach of the pigs, as well as the average daily feed intake of the pigs on day seven. Thermal processing is known to denature milk proteins. However, cascade membrane filtration delivers proteins in their native state, which closely resembles stage one infant milk formula. Thank you. Good morning everyone. In this first presentation I will talk about proteins and amino acids bioaccessibility in a sodium reduced prototype of Parmigiano Reggiano. The relationship between high sodium intake and the onset of hypertension has been widely demonstrated. Since the largest proportion of sodium daily ingested is not discretionary, many technological interventions are executed to gradually reduce these micronutrients in food formulations. Variations in food recipes inevitably result in food structure changes, which in turn influence other nutrients' bioaccessibility. Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese is rich in protein but also in sodium, so the aim of this study was to assess if the reduction of sodium content in Parmigiano-Reggiano samples modifies proteins and amino acids by accessibility compared to the standard normosodic counterpart. Standard and low sodium parmesan underwent static in vitro digestion. During the analysis, three intermediate samples were taken at the end of the gastric phases, in the middle and at the end of the duodenal phase. On all three intermediate points, the protein content was quantified by Comassi Blue SA for high molecular weight protein and by quantifying absorbance and 280 nanometer for aromatic amino acids. Finally, kinetic of amino acid release was quantified by nuclear magnetic resonance. The protein content obtained from both spectrophotometric assays was compared to protein content in the undigested food to obtain the percent value of protein by accessibility. Both the Bradford method and the absorbance at 280 nanometer show that protein bioaccessibility increases during digestion without any statistically significant difference between standard and low sodium parmesan. The kinetic of amino acid release was computed based on the amount of amino acid released during digestion. Low sodium parmesan released significantly more amino acid than standard parmesan already at the end of the gastric phase. 
In conclusion, sodium content reduction seems to lead to a more exhaustive hydrolysis during the gastric phase and low sodium parmesan has a protein digestibility very similar to that um, of the traditional product. On your right, some take-home messages. Thanks for your attention. Hi, my name is Marta and I'm going to talk about the influence of food matrix on chlorophyll by accessibility. Chlorophylls are daily ingested, either naturally present in fruit, vegetables and seaweeds, or as authorized food colorant in processed foods. Moreover, there are some studies that have demonstrated the presence of a chlorophyll first pass metabolism in mice. However, further studies are needed to deeply understand the availability of chlorophylls, and vitro models are the current method of choice. One of them is the InfoGest in vitro digestion protocol, which is a proposal for assay standardization based on physiological parameters. Nevertheless, due to their inalienability and polarity, chlorophylls need this protocol to be adapted. Additionally, chlorophylls must be first incorporated into the cells before their absorption due to the lipophilic character. For that reason, the aim of this work is to study the critical points to adapt InfoGest in vitro digestion protocol to chlorophylls. In addition, this is the first time that chlorophyll by accessibility is going to be tested in different food matrices. That way, three extreme food matrices with different structural characteristics were analyzed, and five different conditions were tested to establish the determinant factors during the in vitro chlorophyll digestion and mineralization, structure method, type of missing, centrifugation, filtering, and the use of gastric lipase. For using matrices, the structure method is determinant since we could lose polar chlorophylls and ultracentrification should be avoided since it makes difficult the inclusion of non-polar chlorophylls. For high fever matrices, filter should not be used since it may cause a reduction on non-polar chlorophyll rich micelles. For oily matrices, gastric lipase is essential in order to reproduce as much as possible the physiological digestion and micellarization of chlorophylls. In conclusion, first, food matrix is determinant when analyzing chlorophyll by accessibility and is mandatory to adapt the in vitro protocol to each matrix. And second, taking into account the diversity of chlorophyll structures, their reliability and their broad spectrum of polarity, it is essential to be aware of the chlorophyll compounds present in the food to adapt the in vitro digestion model. Finally, the take home message would be chlorophylls are daily consumed. Food matrix is determinant for chlorophyll by accessibility and it's necessary to adapt in vitro digestion protocols to each food matrix. Hi, my name is Cristina Reche. I'm from the Department of Chemistry of the University of Balearic Island. And today I'm going to show my class presentation Effects of high power ultrasound on bioactive compounds released from red pepper during in vitro digestion. As an introduction, high power ultrasound has been used in agrofood industry to intensify mass transfer processes. This is because the ultrasound application produces changes in food microstructure. These changes can modify the uh, bioactive compounds released during the digestion. So the objective of the work was to determine how the application of ultrasound affected the release of bioactive compounds from red pepper during in vitro gastrointestinal digestion. So first of all, the pepper was cut into circular slabs of 20 millimeters. These slabs were introduced into a chamber where the ultrasound were applied. This chamber maintained a temperature of 70.5 degrees and the samples were sonicating during 20, 30, 60, and 120 minutes. The sonicated samples were used to carry out the digestion process. Total phenolic compounds and antioxidant activity was determined uh, in the ultrasound paper in the gastric use and the intestinal use. Results are shown below. After the sonication process, for total phenolic compounds, the release increased up to 38%. And 
and for antioxidant activity increased up to 27%. Release in both gastric and intestinal juices were higher in sonicated samples. For total phenolic compounds, the release increased up to 141 for, for gastric juices and up to 172% for intestinal juices. And for antioxidant activity, the release increased 241% for gastric juices and 229% for intestinal juices. The conclusions of the work were that the treatment with high power ultrasound improved the release of bioactive compounds in red pepper during in vitro gastrointestinal digestion, and this release increased with the time uh, of ultrasound application. The most important message is that the ultrasound power improves by accessibility of bioactive bi compounds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, everybody. I would like to ask the speakers to switch on your camera so we can talk and answer the questions. We have a couple of questions here, so let's start. The first one is for Katal. Since the micro, micro, micro filtration of milk increases hydrolysis after digestion, do you know if this could also modify the allergenicity of the hydrolysates? Hi, thank you for the question. Um, I suppose in our research, we haven't looked at does the processing affect the allergenicity of the built formula, but I know there's a lot of research out there looking at this and looking at novel processing techniques that may reduce lactose intolerance in children and other allergenic reactions. So as of yet, we haven't looked at that, no. Thank you very much. So our next one is for Marta. Is there much evidence that chlorophyll is taking up into the human body? Okay, uh, no. At the moment, we have uh, one work from Edner in which um, they demonstrate the absorption of chlorophylls, but they use uh, synthetic chlorophylls. And in our group, we have um, a work in which we have uh, seen um, chlorophyll absorption, but in mice. But um, now we are at the very beginning of the, our project. We are working with uh, mitra digestion and a human body is the next step. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we have another one here, again for Katal. Uh, you see a higher intake of CMF that it's cascade membrane fil filtration, right? Compared to ATG formula. Uh, and how would you explain this difference? And is it based on a daily feeding or per feeding? And also, does the number of feeding a day change over time? And do you think this could be translated to infants? Yeah, so in our study, the milk produced by the membrane filtration technology was had a reduced thermal load in comparison to the high temperature. So that's why we believe the cascade membrane filtered infant formula had a higher average daily feed intake and degree of hydrolysis. And in our study, the pigs were fed once in the morning at 8 a.m. and again in the evening at, at 5 p.m. So in terms of translating that to actual infants, it does translate exactly to the average feeding time of a baby that would be received in stage one infant formula in the first six months of life. Thanks a lot. I think you answered the question, yeah. We have more questions here. I don't know if we still have time. Let's see. I think we can have one more. Uh, one more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other one is for, for Marta again. Uh, do you think we should adapt um, we should adapt it for the that, I'm sorry, yeah. How, how, how do you think we should adapt the food digestion methods to each food matrix? Okay, I think um, that we should uh, take foods 
that represents each matrix and uh, try to um, focus on the uh, steps of uh, image digestion that could affect uh, that it's a specific uh, matrices. That is what we have uh, done with, with, with these uh, matrices. Thank you very much. I think we don't have time anymore. So I'm going to hand over the next session to Gaeta. Thank you for all the speakers and let's go to the next session. <laughs> Thank you, Talita. Uh, I'm glad to introduce the fourth session. Um, uh, we will begin with Alvaro Garcia Fuentes from Maastricht University in Netherlands, followed by Elena Cervello from the University of Bologna in Italy. Then Alicia Belancio Sevilla from the Institute of Food Science Research in Spain. Uh, after that, Anais Lavoisier will present uh, from the University of Paris Saclay in Ryan Agro Paris Tech in France. And to finish, Marcos Infantes from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Please enjoy. Of course, I will ask all the presenters to turn off our camera and Mike, thank you. Good day, everybody. My name is Alvaro Garcia, and today I'm going to present the results of our study where we found that oral processing does not affect the physical stability of safflower oil emulsion filled calcium alginate beads containing yogurt and ice cream. Uh, lipids are strong inducers of satiety in the distal small intestine. And encapsulation of dietary lipids in uh, heart of the beads uh, has proven to be a good strategy to delay their digestion because if we digest the lipids, they will not be able to reach the ileum where they can induce the satiety. So encapsulation is very good for this. However, to be effective, these encapsulates must remain intact during the manipulation and breakdown of food inside the mouth. So the aim of this research was to investigate the effect of oral processing on physical stability of these safflower oil emulsion filled calcium alginate beads that uh, are contained in yogurt but also in ice cream. So what we did is that uh, we prepared the calcium alginate beads uh, filled with soft flour oil and we, uh, we recruited 26 participants that uh, we give them the different products, the yogurt or the ice cream with the uh, encapsulates in it and we asked them to process them uh, in their mouth for their own specific terms. We determine the specific terms of each of them. And then uh, after that, we determine, or we ask them to process that for that time. We collected the bolus and from the bolus, we clean the, the different encapsulates. We clean the encapsulates and then we measure the bit size and the oil content. So what we found was that uh, there was no physical disruption on the bit. So you can see in this uh, uh, picture, that we have the control, so just a bit the, uh, just after being produced, and we have the yogurt and the ice cream. However, we found that the bit size was significantly different between the control and the yogurt and the ice cream bits, meaning uh, that they, uh, they reduced the size a little bit. And uh, oil content uh, was uh, only increased after ice cream, and yogurt has a, a small increase, but it was not significant. So in conclusion, we found that oral processing did not affect the physical stability, but modify some of these physical characteristics, such as the bit size and, and uh, the final oil content uh, of the uh, safflower oil and motion filled hydrogen bits in both in yogurt and ice cream. So in con uh, as a take home message, we can say that the microsites hydrogen bits are not modified basically during oral processing and that they can represent a good carrier of ingredients through the GI and in this case for the lipids and the effect on, uh, to try to trigger satiety. Thank you very much and if you have any questions I will be uh, happy to help you with. Good morning, the title of my research is Glucose and Ptosin Friendly Affect Metabolites Diffusion in Capture Cells Anomic Approach. 
Excessive intake of sugars can promote the development of obesity and related diseases type 2 diabetes. To fully understand the dynamics of carbohydrate intestinal absorption and their metabolic transformation within the intestinal cells could be important for the development of nutritional strategies to reduce their availability. The aim of these studies is to evaluate the diffusion and intestinal metabolism of glucose, fructose and sucrose using the intestinal cell line CACO2. Cacucci cell uh, were incubated for different times with the MEM containing 25 millimolar glucose, fructose or sucrose in the apical chamber and PBS in the basolateral one. At the end of incubation, the diffusion of metabolites from the apical to the basolateral chamber was evaluated by NMR. Our results have demonstrated that sucrose was not hydrolyzed by Cacucci cells and slightly diffused via paracellular transport at longer incubation time. Glucose and fructose diffusion from apical to basolateral chamber was time dependent, and the increase of daily concentration in the basolateral chamber was more evident after two hour incubation. Alanine, glutamic acid, and prolim uh, were not present in the medium of the apical or the basolateral chamber. Over the time, alanine and uh, uh, glutamic acid concentration increase in both chambers with some difference between glucose and glucose supplemented cells. Prolim concentration increase only in the basolateral chamber of glucose supplemented cells under six hours. Three amino acid were detected in both chambers and their distribution varied with time and type of supplementation. Lactate and ethanol concentration increase with time in both chambers, more evidently in glucose supplemented cells. Our preliminary results confirm that coupling CACOCHO cells with NMR techniques, it is possible to evaluate nutrient diffusion and to generate a hypothesis about the cell metabolic behavior and upon exposure to specific nutrients. Further studies will evaluate the modulation of genes involved in transport and metabolism of ISOs. In conclusion, sucrose was not hydrolyzed by CACOCHO cells and diffused via paracellular transport. The most of glucose diffused into the basolateral chamber while fructose under went extensive metabolization and the fructose supplementation has determined a greater uptake of the other metabolites. This study represents a step forward towards understanding dietary glucose and fructose metabolism. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I am Alicia Villanco and I'm a predoctoral student at the Institute of Food Science Research in Madrid at the Food Biotechnology and Microbiology Department. My thesis project aims to assess the impact of food additives on the human gut microbiome. And in particular, I will present the impact of the carotene and fed microbiota on intestinal permeability. It's well known that diet has an impact on gut microbiota composition and on its metabolic activity, which in turn can impact health. In this regard, due to an increase in processed foods intake, it's important to evaluate if food additives could interact with the microbiota and further impact our health. Thus, the aim of this work is to assess the impact of the collagen and fed microbiota on epithelial cells by evaluating cytotoxicity and barrier factor. About this method, um, microbiota samples were obtained from the dynamic simulator of the human microbiota fed with carrageenan. Um, CACO2 cells were used as an epithelial model. Cell viability and cytotoxicity were evaluated using the NTTSA, which is a colorimetric essay for assessing cell metabolic activity, and monolayer integrity was evaluated by transepithelial electrical resistance and by the Lucifer yellow essay, which is a fluorimetric essay um, that will allow us to evaluate the paracellular permeability. Results showed that carrageenan didn't have any impact on either cytotoxicity or molecular integrity. These results are in agreement with the EFSA scientific opinion that mentioned that there's no indication that food grade carrageenan at the estimated dietary exposure level is associated with induction of intestinal inflammation. On the other hand, hydrolyzed carrageenan did affect both parameters, with its concentration rate to decrease. 50% uh, of the cell viability was lower than 0.3 gram liter. However, taking into account the microbiota role, carotene and fed microbiota decreased the integrity with a low response effect. 
studies are on the progress to the CPA if partially metabolized carotenone was pelleted with the macrobiota and or carotenone fitted caused changes in the microbiota composition. To conclude, carotenone didn't have an impact on either cytotoxicity or monodoyon integrity. Nevertheless, hydrolyzed carotenone it had an impact on both parameters, and microbiota fed with carotenone could have an impact on the intestinal permeability. So, further studies are needed for unraveling the likely impact of carotenone on the intestinal microbiota, and the impact of food additive on the intestinal microbiota should be taken into account when assessing safety issues of food additives. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, my name is Anaïs Lavoisier and I'm a postdoctoral researcher. Today I will talk about in vitro digestion of oil in water emulsions containing mushroom extracts. This work is the result of collaboration between the research unit Safe Food, which is part of the French National Research Institute in RAE and the University of Milan in Italy. The pro-oxidant conditions in the gastrointestinal tract may reduce the bioavailability of lipophilic vitamins and limit their beneficial effects. Therefore, we need to design delivery systems that can protect bioactive lipophilic compounds from oxidative degradation during digestion. In a previous study, sunflower oil, which has a high content in alpha tocopherol was encapsulated by spray drying with maltodextrins and different emulsifiers, acacia gum as a control, and two mushroom extracts rich in beta-glucans. These emulsions were digesting according to the recommendation of the InfoGest network, and we evaluated the microstructure of the emulsion and the degradation of alpha tocopherols after each step of the simulated digestion. During the oral and gastric phases, both mushroom extracts were able to stabilize the emulsions. More coalescence was observed with extract B, which may be related to the different molecular weights of the beta glucans in the extracts. During the intestinal phase, similar mixed mycel were observed in the free samples. But the emulsion containing extract B was less digested by pancreatic lipase, which is probably related to the partial coalescence of the old droplets in the gastric phase. Now, if we look at the content in alpha tocopherols, we can see that both mushroom extracts protecting the vitamin from oxidation during the oral and gastric steps of the digestion. However, at the end, of the intestinal phase, no vitamin was found in the sample, probably because of some oxidative degradation phenomenon. In conclusion, mushroom extract were able to fairly stabilize the old droplets during the first steps of the digestion, and both types of emulsifiers led to the formation of mixed micelles during the intestinal phase. The antioxidant properties of beta-glucans increased the stability of the emulsions and protected them from oxidation until the beginning of the intestinal phase of the digestion. Thank you for your attention. Dear attendees, my name is Marcos Infantes, and today I will present you a very interesting topic on how to influence the kinetics of lipid digestion in the gastric and small intestinal phase by focusing on the emotion interfacial composition and, of course, using the InfoGest protocol. As a brief introduction, we should know that lipid digestion is an interfacial phenomenon, so it means that the interface can impact it by first competing with the lipase for absorbing to the interface and second, by influencing the emotion stability. Limited information is, however, available in this matter, especially with respect to the gastric phase. Therefore, our objective was to obtain insights into how to influence the in vitro kinetics of lipolysis by playing with the emotion interfacial composition. And to reach this objective, we prepare emotions with 5% triolein and 1% of the surface active compounds of different chemical nature, classified in small surfactants, and biopolymers. 
We subjected these emotions to in vitro digestion following the updated in vitro InfoGest protocol and applying a kinetic approach in the gastric and small intestinal phase. Lipid digestion products were quantified via HPLC coupled to a charged aerosol detector. In the gastric phase, a wide range of lipolysis behaviors was observed depending on the emotion interfacial composition. In case of the sodium taurodoxicolate emotion, its gastric instability led to a low extent of lipolysis. Biopolymers at the interface show little resistance for gastric lipase absorption causing a very high extent of, extent of lipid digestion. The sitting at the interface exhibited a moderate competition with gastric lipase, resulting in a medium extent of lipolysis, while 380 did not allow gastric lipase absorption, leading to a negligible level of lipolysis. In the small intestinal phase, a different scenario occurred due to the presence of bile salts. Very fast lipolysis kinetics took place for all emotions with a relatively stable droplet size in the gastric phase, but this was not the case for the sodium taurodoxicolate emotion, which was broken in the gastric phase and restructured during the first term of the small intestinal phase. In the, view, in the figure of bot on the bottom, we observe a negative correlation between the droplet size at the end of the gastric phase and the lipolysis rate constant. As a conclusion, we can say that lipid digestion kinetics could be modulated in the gastric phase by the interfacial composition, but in the small intestinal phase, these kinetics are signif were significantly influenced by the emotion gastric stability. As a take-home message, I would suggest to test more complex interfaces with the aim of modulating the lipid digestion kinetics in the small intestinal phase from an interfacial de uh, design perspective. Thank you. Thank you everyone for this very interesting presentation. I will ask the speakers to turn on their micro and camera. Uh, we have some questions from the attendees here. The first question is for Elena uh, from Elena Arendt. Um, and based on your results, do you think that the use of DMEM instead of transport buffers in the apical compartment could influence the permeability of food ingredients? Yes, thank you for, uh, for the question. Yes, uh, uh, can uh, influence the permeability of food, uh, food uh, in ingre ingredients because uh, the mem contain uh, um, glucose, fructose, sucrose, and uh, other metabolites uh, like uh, amino acid and uh, carbonylic uh, uh, compounds. Thank you. Uh, the one question from Pete Wilde, it's for Anais. Uh, Anais, what component is the beta-glucan extract? Uh, do you think we're responsible for emulsifying activity? Well, uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, in the extract we have both uh, beta-glucans and proteins. So we think that uh, proteins may be at the interface. And actually we saw a difference between the extracts and the difference between the extracts was a difference in the molecular weight of the proteins inside in the extract. So um, yeah, we think that it's mainly proteins and um, also the beta-glucans that help in, at the interface. Thank you for your answer. Another question for you. Uh, how significant is oxidation of lipids in the gastrointestinal phase and what is its biological importance? Well, um, in this case, we were studying the, the lipolysis because we have a, a vitamin like the vitamin E, like the alpha tocopherols, that is absorbed in the intestine. So, so we needed to reach the intestine in good conditions. And that's why we need to preserve uh, its, its uh, properties uh, until the, the, this phase. Uh, and uh, if uh, everything is, uh, all the structure is destroyed before or um, the properties are uh, different uh, when they reach the intestine, then the objective is not really uh, completed. Yeah, mm. Thank you. Um, we have another question here, this time for Marcos. Um, Marcos, uh, team members, is asking, what is your HPLC method measuring? And does it discriminate between uh, diacylglycerols and free fatty acid? Uh, 
Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Actually, because of the time frame of the presentation, I could not present more results. Uh, but our method uh, was is able to separate tax, uh, tax, max, and free fatty acids, and even we can separate uh, the oleine and monooleine radioisomers. So I would suggest the uh, the people to to have a look to the papers which are already published, and they can see more information there. Thank you. Thank you. So let's check the paper. Um, Alicia, Alice Jordan, I uh, have a question for you. She is asking, which method do you use uh, to prepare the emulsions? Sorry, could you repeat, please? Uh, for Alvaro, sorry, not, <laughs> not Alicia. <laughs> not in presentation. Alvaro, excuse me. Yeah, uh, same question. Which method did you use uh, to prepare the emulsions? Yeah, so we uh, just basically, uh, um, how can I say, yes, traditional method that we mix the uh, whey protein with the soft flour, oil, soft flour oil, and then we incorporate the mix of uh, uh, alginate to basically after that uh, make a high uh, isotropic yeah, ionic uh, gelation of the uh, alginate to create the encapsulate, but it's uh, just with a uh, uh, yeah, uh, mix in, in general. Okay, thank you. And we have another question for you, Alvaro. Um, you mentioned the size of the beads, uh, different for the control beads, beads added to yogurt and to ice cream. Yeah. Uh, is this type difference occurring upon oral processing or prior to it? You know, and do you have an explanation for it? Yeah, it's open oral processing, and and not not after the control. And we think that it's also because uh, alginate depends uh, on the the gels of alginate depend also on pH. With a lower pH, they would shrink. So then, when we incorporate it into the yogurt, and the longer it, or in this case also ice cream, uh, but in, mostly in yogurt, when the longer they stay there it may be possible that a small shrinkage of the uh, gels. So that's the possible reason, but actually at the end, that shrinkage uh, is not really, yeah, uh, too, uh, too big uh, for, at least for our purpose in this case. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, Alicia, I come back to you. I think Talita, we have time for a last question for Alicia. One more, yes. <laughs> oh, perfect. So, Alicia, a question from Didier Dupont. Uh, did you look at different types of uh, carrageenan and are they all the same? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, uh, Idolized carrageenan uh, did affect the primarity and the carrageenan without a, without a, a hydrolyzed Hydrolyzation uh, don't affect the permeability. Doesn't. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm checking. I think we answered all the questions from the audience. Thank you very much. So we can move on on the next session, session five, which is the last session for this first presentation. Um, and we introduce it, uh, we will first start with uh, Marilisa Alonghi from the University of Udin uh, in Italy, then Joachim Calvo Lerma from the University of Valencia in Spain, then Catherine Okafor from the University of Leeds in UK, and finally Ivana Prodic uh, from the University of Belgrade uh, from Serbia uh, will end this session. Thank you very much for your presentation. Good afternoon. Today, I will briefly share with you the results of a study on lipolysis and curcuminoid bioaccessibility as affected by different ologelators. Ologels are structures in which liquid oil is converted into a semi-solid material by the self-assembly of ologelators. 
besides guaranteeing the technological performances required for solid fats, solar gels can bring about also beneficial physiological effects, such as modulation of fat digestion and delivery of lipophilic bioactive. As different orogelators provide a network with different physical properties based on the self-assembly mechanism, the aim of our study was to understand their effect on sunflower oil lipolysis and on the bioaccessibility of curcuminoids. These were selected as a representative study. Case being highly susceptible to oxidation under gastrointestinal conditions and poorly soluble in gastrointestinal fluids. Sunflower oil was thus enriched with curcuminoids and then gelled by different orogelators to obtain orogels differing for their physical properties. Gels were finally in vitro digested and tested for lipolysis and curcuminoid bioaccessibility. The rate and extent of lipolysis decreased from oil to orogel and was inversely correlated with firmness and rheological parameters. The macroscopic structure was thus inferred to be responsible for the observed effect. In fact, a higher firmness would physically obstruct lipolytic enzyme activity, resulting in a delayed and restrained release of fatty acids. This, in turn, can result in a beneficial health outcome, leading to a lower triglyceride serum level. The different orogel network also affected curcuminoid bioaccessibility. However, in this case, the differences among orogelators seem to lie in the microscopic structure. Depending on the self-assembly mechanism of orogelators, the bioactive can be differently located, being ultimately more or less soluble and or susceptible to degradation during digestion. Summing up, orogels can be exploited not only for their technological performances as fat replacer, but also for their nutritional functionality to modulate fat digestion and aid delivery systems for bioactive ingredients. Finally, we should keep in mind that the drivers for such functionalities can be differently affected by the structural level of orogel, depending on their macro or microscopic properties. Last but not least, I want to thank my research group from the University of Udine as working together and even more fun to research activities. Good morning, everybody. My name is Joaquim Calvo Lerma, and I'm going to present the abstract entitled Improved Digestibility and Lipid Profile in Fermented Chia and Sesame Seeds. This work was carried out along with Andrea Asensio Grau, Ana Heredia, and Ana Andres at Universitat Politecnica de Valencia in Spain. Fermentation of plant-based substrates with edible fungi enhances nutrient profile and digestibility. However, this bioprocess is scarcely applied in edible seeds, which are characterized by high content of healthy lipids. In this work, Chia and sesame seeds were solid state fermented with Pleurotus ostreatus, followed by drying and miling. The fermented and controlled chia and sesame products were characterized for fatty acid profile by GCMS and then were in vitro digested with a static model and lipolysis was determined by nuclear magnetic resonance. The resulting fermented products showed a change in the fatty acid profile. Concretely, we observed increased polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially linoleic acid, which increased from 18.5 to 25.1% of total lipid content in chia and from 47.5 to 57.8 in sesame. And also we documented a concomitant decrease in saturated fats, specifically palmitic and stearic acids in both seeds. And then after in vitro digestion, we detected higher lipolysis in sesame than in chia products. And this was evidenced by the molar percentage of fatty acids, monoglycerides and diglycerides. And also we observed that the fermented counterparts achieved higher lipolysis extent, mainly in free fatty acids compared to the unfermented controlled samples. 
and concretely this was 76.9 against 28.4 of molar percentage in Chia and 68.7 against 54.9 in sesame. As a conclusion, the application of solid state fermentation on chia and sesame seeds could be an innovative approach to improve their nutritional quality. And the take home message is that solid state fermentation with Pleurotus ostreatus in fat rich seeds can change the fatty acid profile and improve lipid digestibility. Thank you all for your attention. Hello everyone, I am Catherine Okafo, a PhD student in School of Food Science and Nutrition in Bastille, Leeds. My topic, production of ready-to-eat porridge with green banana fruit, carbohydrate composition, digestibility, and morphological structure. Green banana, Musa, is an important starchy food crop for food and nutrition, Due to climatary in the shelf life of banana is relatively short, relatively short, resulting in, in resulting in rapid deterioration. One strategy to one strategy to prevent wasting of banana is to process green banana fruit into a long life ready to eat porridge that is safe, nutritious, and acceptable to consumers. The study aims at to produce RT banana porridge with optimal nutrition and food safety properties. Processing method used was peeling, slicing, even drying down to reconstitution. Our focus was on measuring the effects of processing steps on carbohydrate availability of raw and processed material. Total digestible resistant starch, sugar of raw flours and porridges at various steps of processing were determined using simulated enzymatic digestion method. You can see here that this, this, figure, this figure is showing major processing steps involved during the, during the ROT in floor development. You can see floor and rest of them. Here shows that here shows that the floor particles contained in stark, intact starch granules covered by cell wall material as shown here. Here is the porridge. It shows that the porridge consists of cell, cell, uh, stark cell wall polymer gel with few remaining intact starch granules, as you can see here. Then this, fig this table is showing us that all these processing steps significantly affect carbohydrate digestibility. Then this figure here is showing us that the RTE, the RTE porridge at the, reconstituted at different temperatures have reduced carbohydrate digestibility when compared with the floor, with the fresh one. Then the conclusion is a high digestible RTE porridge has been damaged. Cooking and reconstitution gave rise to more digestible starch. Gelatinization of starch resulted in a quicker accessibility of the digestive enzyme to the starch. Our take home message is that high digestible green banana flour has been made. Hello, in the next uh, three minutes, I will explain your application of InfoJet protocol on raw and roasted hazelnut and then the IG response and comparison between the two types of hazelnut preparation. Uh, this slide shows a review of the literature where we see how important it is to simulate physiological conditions during digestion. Since I work a lot of experimental, it is very important to carefully handle the sample after digestion in the sense of thinking how to remove the components that interfere and then we examine the proteins, how much they are digested by 1D, 2D, uh, uh, CD spectroscopy and what is their IJ potential or any other property of protein which you want to examine. Only this gives us a real insight into what is possible in the vivo. Since hazelnuts have 15% of protein and 65% of lipids, on the first gel we can see that the lipids are the ones who interfere while assessing proteins in hazelnut. Around 48 kds we can see core 11, 
uh, coronine is made out of two subunits, acidic subunit, which is uh, around uh, 40 kDs, and basic subunit around 30 kDs. Uh, epitopes are mostly on acidic subunit. Uh, gel in the middle, where, uh, where less the sample is applied, and thus uh, weaker protein bands are. However, proteins are detected with antibodies of allergic patients, and we can see, notice that all bands retain their IgE potential even after digestion and roasting. So maybe just the coronine slightly loses activity in the raw uh, hazelnut digestion sample. Since coronine uh, together with core 11 is the most abundant protein in hazelnut, we decided to isolate this coronine and see if it is actually affected by roasting and if we can get some conclusion whether coronine behaves in raw and roasted hazelnut similarly during digestion. And we can see that those changes in secondary structure are minimal and have very similar IgE potential. After 1D, we also did 2D gels and blood. It is very difficult to get 2D gels with uh, such fatty samples. And here it is important to say that due to the amount of protein, core 14 is not visible. Core 8 is hidden behind this vertical smear in basic pH range, which probably belongs to fats. With blood uh, of all four samples, we detected core 11 with a difference uh, that in both digested samples the signal is less visible than in its uh, counterpart control, which may lead us to say that roasting still affect the coronine, but in a wet way it is necessary to investigate. So, to conclude, uh, gastric phase digestion of hazelnut results in partial extraction and digestion of core 11 and core 9, giving large digestion-resistant peptides with preserved, uh, preserved IgE-binding epitopes. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers. I'd like to ask you to switch on your camera, please, so we, we can talk about the questions. So we have a, a couple of questions here. The first one is for Joaquin. Why do saturated fat acids preferentially go down during the fermentation step? Well, uh, there are very few literature addressing the issue of fermenting uh, fat-rich substrates with, um, with microorganisms. And uh, now I'm working on the preparation of, the, of a paper out of, uh, from these results. And I have, for the moment, uh, could find uh, any available reference explaining this finding. However, there are some studies in which the same uh, tendency in which decreased uh, fatty uh, saturated fatty acids uh, in favor of increased polyunsaturated have been reported. But the reason may be that uh, uh, for the uh, metabolism of the fungus, these uh, saturated fatty acids are pre preferable. They, they have more affinity for this type of fatty acids. And then the bioconversion into polyunsaturated fatty acids may depend on the type of uh, trans uh, 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 enzymes and so on of the fungus. Thank you very much. We have a, another question for you. Um, I had not pre previous information about the microorganism that ferments the chia seeds. It's present in the natural microbiota of the seed. Do you know the final pH of the fermented product? Well, uh, the microbiota that is uh, naturally in the seeds was uh, destroyed because the products were first autoclaved and then we inoculated uh, only Pleurotus ostreatus and uh, the, the steril sterilization conditions remain uh, during the process. And the pH, no, we didn't measure the pH. Thank you very much. Now our next is, uh, question is from Marilisa. What is the stability of oligels during gastrointestinal digestion? Yes. Um... I guess that the question deals with the stability, the physical chemical stability, because we, in this work, we actually focus on the fate of uh, curcuminoids. So we mainly um, focus on that. But anyway, we also get an insight into the particle size distribution and set of potential. And overall, we did not find great differences among the different oleogels, uh, but all oleogels um, differed quite, quite considerably from the oil. 
um, the results we obtained about the physical stability of the oil gels were uh, in line with the literature, but indeed this is uh, an aspect that needs to be further investigated. Actually, we mainly focus on the fate at the end of the intestinal phase, but uh, we should also get an insight into what happens also at the end of the gastric phase in order to be able to modulate the structuring, uh, for instance, to deliver uh, lipophilic bioactives, as in this case, um, until the intestinal level in order to make them available for absorption or even to make them available for the further microbial activity. So um, I also want to, to underline that even if in some cases bioaccessibility can be lower than that of oil, this is not necessarily a negative aspect. In fact, the bioactive compounds such as curcuminoids, but also phenolic compounds may also play a role further on, uh, such as in, at the colon level, for the microbial activity. So we should look not just at the bioaccessibility, but also in the future studies at what remains uh, undigested and available for fermentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question is for Katarine. How easy is it to reconstitute the RT, RTA, RTE porridges? And do they taste nice? Yes, thank you very much for your question. Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, thank you very much. We, do we have a time for one, one, one more question? I think we have, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we are a little in advance. So if you have one or two more questions, okay. Ah, great. Because I still have more questions here. So let's see. Uh, this one is for Ivana. Do you have any idea about how resistant these peptides are to intestinal digestion? No, no, only I did uh, gastric phase, uh, uh, only gastric phase. Okay, thank you. The other question is for Joaquin. Um, what is the best way to add these novel fer fermented foods to our diets? And as a food or, a, or in ingredient in, in other food? Well, this is a very interesting question because uh, the answer could be both. Uh, we could use this product as a finished product. We could incorporate it to other uh, food matrices to, um, to take them together. They have a very particular organoleptic characteristics. For example, the, the fermented chia uh, uh, resembles to the uh, aroma of, uh, of sardines, of fish. So they could be used as a, a, a fish substitute. And also the, the fermented chia is like a paste and it could be used also as a substitute of spreadable uh, food for bread toasts or, or, or something like that. And the important thing here is that the uh, improved um, fatty acid profile makes them a, a good uh, alternative to other sources like for example fish because we have to take into account the respect uh, to the planet and we have to consider environmental aspects when uh, working in the design of uh, improved or new food ingredients. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, can we, we have one, one, one more question? Uh, this one is for, for Katarine. Uh, do these flowers could be used as a source of hesitant starch as an ingredient to in enrich other foods and increase their resistant starch content? For this particular ready-to-eat product, you, I, I develop it so that people can eat it as it is, because the next step after they have developed is, is to fortify it. So I made it in a way that people can eat it, because during that development, I have already changed the digestibility that was 
Formerly, the, 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 the raw material I used was of a low digestibility, but after the development, I've changed it now to be a high digestible product. And the target consumers are the people that need more energy. Basically, the children or the elderly people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we answered all the questions. That's great. So thank you for all the speakers for the great presentations. And now I'm going to hand over the session, the final session to Daniela. So let's go. Thank you. Thank you, Talita. So um, thank you to all the speakers for being here and um, for um, preparing all your presentations. We will send any questions that have not been answered to the speakers so that they can answer them later by email. And also, as you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we will take <clears throat> your vote into consideration when selecting the best flash presentation for the award that will be announced tomorrow. So now is the time to start voting. You can follow the link that um, Gaetan just posted in the chat. So it will uh, take you to the to menti.com. And then once you're on the website, you can enter the code um, that is now on your screen, 10, 12, 77, 5. And then from there, you can choose up to two of your favorite presentations. So we will give you some minutes now um, to start voting. We will probably have the first votes coming in soon. I think Maureen is following the, the, vo the votation now on the website. So we can wait for an update. What to say is things. Maybe we can share. Maybe we can share the um, live voting now. Yes. In the meantime, uh, we want to really thank all the speakers. We know that it is quite a challenge to summarize your research in less than three minutes. So we want to congratulate all of you because you have all done an excellent work. Uh, the winner of the Best Flash Presentation Award will be announced tomorrow during the last session of the conference uh, that will be at around 1.25 p.m. Irish time or uh, 2.25 p.m. Central European time. Thank you, Maureen. So the, it's still ongoing. It's quite small on my screen. So we wait one more minute. And just to add uh, once again, thank you, Daniela, for this nice uh, uh, closing remarks. Just to add once more, the voting and the winners um, this decided by the panelists tonight will be taken into consideration with, uh, alongside with other criteria. And uh, tomorrow, uh, as Daniela already said, we will have the final, the final winners and very nice prize waiting for you. Okay, for now. Okay. Yes, so I think. Yeah, votes are still coming in. Still, <laughs> still some votes coming. We, we have... didn't mention, but we hope 
no one have voted for themselves. <laughs> anyway, we will see. Um, it's it it will be the tie between F fourteen F eleven. I would say. Yes. And F twenty. It's it's a bit difficult to see here, but yeah, we'll we will yeah. take into the consideration your votes and uh, and the other uh, other criteria we have. Uh, I, I think we can. Content. I think we can select at least a top five from where we are now, with uh, uh, presentation 11, 20, 21, 22, and presentation three, three yes. being the most voted up until now. So perhaps we will leave uh, the vote the voting on until 8 p.m. <laughs> or I don't know if there are still votes coming in and we can start closing uh, this session for the, this evening. Yeah, I think we have 46 participants for now, it's 47, it's really nice. Mm. Thank you for the attendees, for the participation, really active yeah. for the questions, definitely. Uh, we will just let uh, the people vote until eight, but we can close I think, the session. Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining this uh, special session of flash presentations for the of the virtual international conference on food digestion. Um, we hope to see you all tomorrow again for the last session of the conference, which will start at 7.30 a.m. Irish time. So that is 8.30 uh, Central European time. And also for the announcement of the best flash presentation at the end of the session. Thank you very much. I don't know if you, anyone, any of you wants to add something. Perfect. Thanks Thank you. Thank, 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 you. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you everybody. Goodbye and thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Good evening.